Hi, I'm Eva Lee's Page, and thanks for listening to the Believe Big Podcast, the show where we take a deep dive into your healing with health experts, integrative practitioners, biblical faith leaders, and cancer thrivers from around the globe. Welcome to today's episode on the Believe Big Podcast. My name is Eva Lise Page, and it's an honor to spend this time with you. The use of off-label drugs for treating cancer is finally gaining traction. Yet our guest today, Jane McClellan, discovered it herself in 2003. A little bit about Jane. Jane is a long-term survivor of stage four cancer. She is a former chartered physiotherapist, and Jane is an award-winning author of how to Starve Cancer, in which describes her journey through cancer and her battle with infertility. She is best known for her Metro Map, a simple diagram of the complexity of cancer metabolism, and for bringing the new approach to the public. Because of her efforts to educate cancer patients since 2004, Jane was awarded Amazing Woman Global 2019 Lifetime Achievement Award. She also won the UK Health Radio Award in 2022 for Cancer Services. Such an honor. Welcome, Jane, to the show. Thanks so much for having me on. So our listeners are always interested in discovering what our guest's favorite health tip is. And I know you have many, but can you share one with us? Gosh, there are a lot. (laughs) But I think if you're trying to prevent cancer or if you're trying to treat cancer, looking after your gut, it's not something I talk about an awful lot in my book, but actually looking after your gut is something which I do stress as particularly for prevention as well. There's a lot of evidence to suggest leaky gut actually causes pathogens to get into the whole system. So we need to be really looking after our gut really well. So lots of probiotics and kefir and things like that. If you are trying to prevent cancer, I think that's really critically important. And you can get non-dairy kefir type things as well, made from coconut and things like that as well. So I think it's really important to be looking after your gut all the way through your life. It is something I'm not always brilliant at. I have to remind myself to get back on the program and bifidobacteria in particular, I think for cancer are really important. And if you haven't got enough levels, I think an occasional boost is quite useful as well. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it's a area that a lot of people don't realize and the importance, especially with the food quality, at least here in the United States, it's a lot better there in the UK where you are, but I think so. <laughs> no, okay. I don't think we have as many GMO crops as you do, but I think we actually, we can get a lot more organic stuff from Europe as well, but I think our standards are not as high as I would like. Yes. For all of us. So hopefully we'll change some of that as well. You mentioned in your book that during your cancer journey, you became a cancer PubMed Sherlock Holmes. I love that. You discovered that research was focused primarily on the activities of genes in cancer, but what made you curious was the rest of the tumor like the growth factors it used to fuel and et cetera. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. So I obviously learned a little bit about Otto Warburg when I was going through my journey, but there wasn't an awful lot. It was very hard to actually research back in my day because the internet was still fledgling and it was very hard unless I actually went into hospitals or I looked through the journals or I got lots of magazines on stuff as well. It was really quite a journey back then. And I was lucky to actually stumble across some of the stuff that I did and get the off-label drugs that I could see enormous potential for. And I was, again, very lucky to actually have a doctor who was willing to prescribe them. But as things have evolved and PubMed became more available online, I even this day, I read probably four or five articles on PubMed every day. <laughs> That's fantastic. And I'm constantly trying to see where things are going. But the whole area of metabolism and cancer is moving a lot every day. So it's really important to try and stay on top of it. I have many Google searches for all sorts of things on my computer. So I'm constantly flagging up things that I want to have a little look. You dive down into these little rabbit holes sometimes, and then you come out somewhere completely different. But it's a journey of discovery, and I actually quite enjoy it. And I like to find answers. I'm always sure there's an answer 
to something somewhere. If you're looking at weird growth factors, or I know that there's probably an off-label drug or a supplement that will probably do something against that particular pathway. So I'm constantly delving around, digging around, trying to find answers. And I find it a challenge and I like it actually. (laughs) So good. And for those who are listening who are unfamiliar with the use of off-label drugs or repurposed drugs for cancer, what does that mean? What is the definition of a repurposed drug and how does that differ from traditional cancer treatments? Okay. So off-label means that drugs are given certain indications when they're approved by the FDA or the MHRA in the UK, they are approved for a particular condition. So metformin, for example, is approved for diabetes. Now it's off-label uses are now for cancer, although it's not actually approved for cancer. So unfortunately, because it's not an approved drug, it's not generally given. So it's off-label. Repurpose means just repurposing a drug for a new area of research. There are an awful lot of drugs being looked at to be repurposed for cancer treatment. Yeah, one that I discovered, my brother-in-law actually shared with me as research he was doing when I was going through my cancer journey with colon cancer was cimetidine. And he found a study that they said that patients who took 400 milligrams in the morning and at night before surgery and a year after had an 86% survival versus 33%. And that study was just like alarming to me. I know it's the H2 blocker and things like that in there, but it's things like that, that patients aren't aware of that can really help. I actually use cimetidine myself as well, actually. So once I'd recovered from cancer, I didn't know that I had cystic fibrosis, that my immune system, I thought it was just my immune system was completely broken from the chemo. And I constantly kept on getting infection after infection and lung problems. And I always thought it was down to a rubbish immune system. And I think that was part of the problem. And in fact, I tested my immune system and it was something known as TH2 dominant rather than TH1. Those are your natural, TH1 is your cancer killing zone, whereas TH2 is more sort of allergic type of humoral response in the cells. And I needed to reverse that balance. And that's where I use cimetidine. And I use exactly the same dose, actually. I use 400 morning and evening in order to reverse the TH2 back to a TH1 dominance in order to give me a bit more natural killer cells and general cells that would actually fight infection. Because I, I, I suffered for many years, actually, not knowing that I had cystic fibrosis, which was only discovered a few months before COVID struck. So I was in a bit of a state at that point because I wasn't given any drugs to cope with it or anything. But actually in September that year of 2020, they came out or they were allowing my particular genetic mutations, which were not your normal cystic fibrosis mutations, but they approved the drugs for cystic fibrosis for my genetic mutations. Bingo. Wow. That just just massive change. That's incredible. (laughs) That's yeah. incredible. And for people who don't yeah. know, metadine is the common name for Prevacid, which is used often for heartburn. She's another. Tagament. Yes. Yeah. Tagament yeah. is another one. So yeah. can you also explain the basic principles of your starve cancer approach and how it works to limit cell growth? A basic thing to understand is that cancer cells are always hungry. They have this massive appetite for food because they're constantly dividing. They constantly need to create new macro molecules to make their daughter cells. So they need the DNA, they need the organelles, they need the cell membranes. So they need to make a lot of protein, they need to make new fat. So that's all part of it. And that's driven by glucose is generally the fuel in order to create the process of making these new proteins and fats. And what happens is cancer breaks down glucose, it breaks down glutamine to actually fuel, and sometimes it breaks down fat as well in order to make the new cells. So my approach is actually to not just some of the glucose, but actually to look at blocking glutamine and fat pathways as well. So I created this triangle, my Metro map, which effectively just goes through the key metabolic pathways that cancer uses to fuel itself. And the way I describe it is that if you block one pathway, cancer is very clever. It just uses another one, but you've got to work out what those synergistic pathways are in order to really get the best effect. And that's something we're still looking at, the synergistic blocking of pathways. But certainly one is the normal oxphos or oxidative phosphorylation, which is the normal process of making ATP, which is the currency of energy. Cancer cells use a different process called glycolysis, 
But if you block the glycolysis, it just uses more oxphos. Vice versa, if you block the oxphos, it uses more glycolysis. So you've actually got to work at blocking both together. And most people don't know that cancer cells consume and actually use an awful lot of glutamine as part of their process of making energy. Interesting. So, is that used for all cancers or do you find that some cancers you have more of cancer, one? You've even got some cancers that are very arginine, which is another amino acid driven like sarcomas and liver cancers are very arginine driven and some brain cancers are very arginine driven. There's a doctor who works down the road here at the Hammersmith Hospital. She uses a special drug and she's getting fantastic results just starving glutamine with this new drug and I just hope I'm actually I had a sarcoma patient on the phone this morning I'm thinking maybe we can use that for her as well because it's blocking the arginine which is the key fuel for sarcomas it's very hard for doctors to justify something sometimes to allow somebody to have something on a compassionate use so she's a stage four sarcoma she's only in her early 30s and she needs some help what do you do that's incredible and we will put links in our show notes to your Metro Map link on how to contact you. And I know you have a list of practitioners that have learned your approach that kind of incorporate it into their integrative oncology that they work with their patients on. So we will make sure to put that on there. Can you Brilliant. give some other examples of repurposed drugs that have been used in cancer treatment and how they had limited cell growth? So my cocktail, just give you my personal cocktail and what worked for me. Initially, I used berberine, which is a natural form of metformin. But later on, I did use metformin as well. That was part of my cocktail. They're both very good for treating diabetes. And then I used lovastatin. It's quite hard to get hold of lovastatin these days. Most people either use simvastatin or atorvastatin. And those statins are fat loving. Very important to get fat loving statins. These generally lower cholesterol. They also have big anti-inflammatory effects and actually synergize really well with some non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And the one that I chose was etodilac. The combination of the statin together with the atodolac, make them five times more effective at killing cancer cells than individually. Statins on their own don't work very well. Metformin on its own doesn't work very well. The non steroidal on its own, and suddenly you get this synergy by adding these things together because they're targeting different things and you get this exponential blocking of what you're trying to do. So those were three things. And then I added diprinamol, which is an old platelet, anti-platelet drug. So it doesn't actually destroy your platelets. What it does is stops them sticking together. That allows your blood circulation to flow through properly. It doesn't allow the cancer cells to stick down into little metastatic niches. So it helps to keep the whole thing flowing. And actually temporarily I used aspirin. I didn't use aspirin and the atodolite together, but I did use aspirin and diprinamol together to begin with until I swapped over to using etodolac. But the diprinamol works synergistically with the statin, they both work on blocking cholesterol pathways. Like I said, with the oxphos and the glycolysis, is the same with these two cholesterol pathways. If you block one, it'll just use the other one. So same thing, you're just blocking two synergistic pathways. And that's what I was doing. I was stopping the formation of cholesterol, which are important little blobs that every single cancer cell has on the surface. So it's just slowing down the ability for it to make those new cell membranes. That's incredible. And I love that you said it's a synergistic effect. And, you know, a big part of therapy as well was mistletoe therapy. And people just say, oh, I just need some mistletoe and that'll cure my cancer. And it's never just one thing. And I love that you are working different pathways. You're synergistically working with many different aspects, not only these repurposed drugs or supplements and mistletoe therapy, whatever it yeah. may be. But what are some other practical tips for incorporating the star of cancer approach from your book into a person's cancer treatment plan besides repurposed drugs? I've got four pillars really of starving the cancer. First one is your diet and it doesn't have to be completely starving yourself. The whole point is that you're using these other things to back up what you're trying to do. So you don't have to go on a completely starving. Some people do fast. There are many ways to do it. Intermittent fasting, you can just have a low GI, plus actually you, you have to have a fairly low protein diet. Ketogenic diet can be useful, but some people get resistant to that. It can lead to resistance after about 30 days. Again, you've got this problem where it's starting to use different pathways. Diet is a big one. 
supplements. I used a heck of a lot of supplements. I was throwing an awful lot at myself because I didn't know enough about what was going to work. But when I found something interesting in the literature into my routine, it would go. So those the supplements is the second thing. Exercise is obviously very good for starving the cancer. And there are many ways that exercise will help. Aerobic exercise will actually oxygenate the tissue, but actually weightlifting, doing some weightlifting will actually starve the cancer even more effectively actually than the aerobic stuff. There are different ways that exercise actually works on cancer. And in fact, I do recommend that people exercise after they've had a meal. They don't have to do great big aerobic exercise after a meal, but they need to do enough just to curb that insulin spike and glucose spike that you get after a meal. So you just keep everything a bit lower. So that can't, that doesn't feed the cancer in quite the same way. I love that. So you have diet, supplements, exercise, and what's your last and pillar? Off-label, off-label drugs as well. Off-label drugs. But, okay. And that's why it's really important to also know what's best for you as an individual, whether it's your diet or exercising, intermittent fasting. And we have a lot of practitioners that help you to determine what is best for you. And I know a lot of them use it before their traditional treatments, if they're pursuing that pathway, because it will help the treatments to work better and also get rid of the toxins faster out of your body. And then exercise, I know that was a difficult one for me when I was in the middle of my journey because I was so weak, but then just to walk yeah. or even just sitting with light weights on just lifting some light weights while you're sitting, watching a show or listening to music or reading. Yeah. There are many ways I love that you mentioned to incorporate those things for your better health. Yeah. This is particularly important. I think actually if you've got cachexia, which is the wasting syndrome that you can get sometimes with cancer, when it's starting to do this salvage autophagy, it's actually eating away at you and munching up parts of your muscle and your fat. This is where exercise can really help as well. And there are some supplements that will help improve cachexia, but you have to take them before you exercise. Again, you don't want the amino acids to go to feeding the cancer. You want it to go to building up your muscle. So it's important to take it at the right time. And cachexia is, I'm probably going to do a blog on that fairly soon, actually, and put that in the newsletter. I think yeah, it's I'll... important. It kills quite a lot of people just wasting away rather than the actual cancer itself. And you have to be incredibly careful about your diet when it's cachexia as well. Can you explain to people what cachexia is? There are several reasons that cachexia happens. One of the problems that you get with cancer is this inflammation. And this causes certain changes in the cancer metabolism. Cancer also has these little tiny micro vesicles that it sheds off, things called exosomes. I don't know whether you've heard of those before. Yes, And these shed off and they take micro RNA and take all sorts of other instructions. And it takes some other articles as well to tell your muscles and your fat zones to break down. And then that gets put into the circulation to feed the tumor. So it's actually a parasite that's eating away at you. And it's that the cancer is actually instructing the body to break down to feed itself. And you get this wasting of your muscles and your fat zones. When I had cancer, I noticed my inner thighs were <laughs> thinner than they'd ever been before. And I knew it was unusual. And that was before I was diagnosed. So I thought, wow, gosh, I have been exercising better than I normally do. And I couldn't understand. But actually that I was misdiagnosed for an awfully long time. Yeah, I definitely had some cachexic changes going on, even when I was first diagnosed back in 1994. Can you share a brief little bit about your story for those who haven't heard your story of overcoming cervical cancer, correct? Yeah. Stage four. In a nutshell, I, I was diagnosed in 94 with cervical cancer that spread to my lungs in 99. So it became stage four as a result of all the treatments that I had, the high dose chemo. They told me that they'll probably kill me with these treatments because they overdosed me so much on all of that because they didn't think I was going to survive anyway. But that then gave me bone marrow cancer, which actually is another really serious illness to try and overcome as well. And it was at that point that I knew I was controlling one cancer because my normal cancer markers for cervical cancer were okay. They were still in the normal range, but these other markers, uh, which showed these glycolytic changes and various other things going on with the leukemia, were way off the charts. So I had to 
change what I was doing. I thought, okay, so the natural approach is the intravenous vitamin C, all the other things that I was doing. I never tried mistletoe and I couldn't get hold of it back then, but I certainly looked into it and then uh, decided to investigate these off-label drugs as well. I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose here. I knew I only had a few weeks to live unless I actually did something fairly radical. I had an understanding doctor, both my oncologists at the time, actually, and I had some wonderful integrative oncologists that I was working with as well. And I got this little cocktail prescribed, checked. I got them from different people. And then I checked that it was okay to add them all together. Eventually, I got this little cocktail together, threw it all together. And seven months later, markers were fine and no trace of cancer, thank God. And I never got any side effects. I didn't even feel like I was on treatment. And that was the funny thing. You normally feel really terrible, awful, sick, really shoddy when you're having treatment. But actually, I didn't really feel like I was ill at all or really suffering during that time. And that's something that is so important. I think that if anything else, whether it's mistletoe or repurposed drugs that help you to go through something so difficult with a great quality of life is huge, not only for the patient, but for their loved ones that are seeing them suffer. And I know that God spared your life for a huge reason to be able to educate and help so many others in these last years that we've had learning about this from you. And I know you have lots of stories from patients that have also been, you're not the only one, even though you were the first test case, Mm -hmm. you're not the only one that has benefited. Do you have a story that stands out to you that you can share briefly about someone else who kind of followed your Metro map or repurposed drugs? I talk about two in my online course. I've got a lady, she was HER2 positive, really bad stage four, but she went to the Seattle integrative people. She did buy protocol. And then she got into remission. She's doing really well. And then it came back again. And I said, you sure you've blocked all the right pathways? And we had a look and she hadn't blocked the salvage autophagy pathway. And this is one of the things that cancer learns to use, maybe sometimes later on. And I said, block that one as well. We added that one into her protocol and bingo, she went back into remission again. So I love that. The fact that she'd done really well, she got herself into remission and In fact, now she's still going strong. This is years later. She is now off all traditional meds. She's not had any more traditional meds. I'm not even sure she's even taking the off-label drugs anymore. I think she's pretty much carrying on as a normal person would, gone back to work and is fine. The other one I discuss in my course is this gentleman who had prostate cancer. His PSA was 1,007. And the reason for that was that he'd been having glutathione, which was fueling his cancer. I'm very wary about people taking glutathione because it leads to resistance. It's a major antioxidant and you actually need to create some free radicals, which is kind of pro-oxidant, the opposite. And he had got to 1007. He was in a wheelchair and it was a disaster. Spinal mets everywhere, paralyzed, partly paralyzed. And he did my protocol and got back down to his PSA is under one and he's back water skiing, having a fantastic time, lives in Hawaii. (laughs) Incredible. And you mentioned something about asking different physicians that you had to prescribe one or the other and other things. And there, I just wanted to share that there are integrative oncologists out there and even oncologists who are willing to help monitor you and work with you. You just have to find the right ones. I know for myself, once I was two years out, I asked him, here, I'm taking some editing. I'm taking all these things. Is there anything I should drop And in, in your opinion? And he looked at me and he's like, do not change a thing. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. <laughs> yes. Don't change a thing. It's working. And I think I probably yeah. stopped the cymetidine four years after I was clear and I eased off of that and I haven't been off on it. But what advice do you have for individuals interested in incorporating this approach of starving cancer into their cancer management plan? Not to get overwhelmed. All right. If they read my book, the key thing is not to get overwhelmed. Try and get themselves in with one of the doctors if they can and they will get them on a basic program. And then from there, I guide people. People read my book many times. I do have an online course as well, which makes things much simpler for people to understand. And I go more into specific pathways of which supplements, which drugs work specifically more for different cancers. And I think people find that incredibly useful. But I think the main thing is to start somewhere. Some people 
read the book and then they don't really get that they actually need to start doing something. You're not going to overcome cancer if you've got stage four, just with the traditional treatments. Very unlikely. Even the new immunotherapies, they don't work as well as they'd like us to imagine they do. But incorporating some of these off-label drugs can be incredibly useful. They're now doing a trial for triple negative breast cancer using a new immunotherapy with ivermectin because that boosts the tumour to make it, instead of being cold, it makes it hot. That means infiltrating lymphocytes can get into it. And that's what ivermectin does. It actually increases the amount of immune cells you actually get in the tumour. So there are many different ways to incorporate lots of different off-label drugs into your protocol. And I think the big thing is to work out if you're having chemo, there might be slightly different protocol to if you're having immunotherapy, to if you're having a targeted drug. There are certain targeted drugs like osimertinib, which you have to take HDAC inhibitors at the same time. You don't need to know what those are necessarily right now, but they are things like um, hydroxy um, butyrates, but the butyrate kind of things. So sodium butyrate and beta hydroxy butyrate, which is a ketone, can actually help to block those. Those are the kind of things you need to know and try and work out your conventional treatment because I'm not against conventional treatments at all. I think we just need to make them work better. At the moment, the cocktails aren't there. They're not targeting the metabolism of the cancer stem cells as well as the fast dividing cells are also quite happily mutating and you need to be able to stop all of that happening in various different ways. Attacking the metabolism, stopping the metabolism actually stops the cancer from mutating and finding a way around those treatments and becoming resistant. So it's all about making the treatments, the normal conventional treatments that you have more effective. I'm definitely not alternative. I'm most definitely complementary. Yes, so. myself as well. And I think too, what a lot of people don't realize is that traditional treatments like chemotherapy and radiation, they don't kill the stem cells. And that's why we have such a high recurrence rate because exactly. people go back, they said, oh, I'm cancer free, no evidence of disease. And they go back one to their old routines, or even if they didn't, they're not addressing those stem cells and it will come back. So it's really wise to incorporate the things that you're sharing to stop exactly. those pathways from rearing their ugly heads again. The cancer stem cells are so few. It's one per 10,000 of the cancer tumor cells are actually the cancer stem cells, but they are the tricky ones that really need to be stopped. So it can look like you got rid of a tumor on a scan, but actually these little pesky stem cells can really cause an awful lot of trouble later on if you don't stop those too. Yes. And so in closing, how do you see the repurposed drugs used in cancer treatment evolving in the future? And what potential mm -hmm. advancements are you most excited about? I have a big chapter on ferroptosis at the end of my second edition. I know that is the future. It's a hot topic in research. It hasn't really made its way down to the bench bedside yet, not in a big way, but I have got a few doctors doing it and getting fantastic results. And I've what is it. that? Explain what that is real quick. Okay, very quickly. So cancer loves iron. It has this massive appetite for iron. So you actually oxidize the iron in the cancer cells and that destroys the cell membranes. Something called peroxide. It's just a sort of a destruction of the cell membrane itself. And that destroys the cancer cell. Totally different way of causing cell death. Apoptosis is the normal cell death mechanism, but this is a slight variation on that. And you can use various things. There are many resistance pathways involved. So I do have a list of supplements and a list of drugs to try and target all of those different things at the same time. Again, it's got to be a cocktail that works. Intravenous vitamin C is part of it, but it doesn't work on its own. That's why a lot of people have intravenous vitamin C because that creates hydrogen peroxide. That's the oxygen that you need to trigger this oxidation of the iron, but you need to have it in combination with some other stuff. Doing intravenous vitamin C on its own doesn't work. Artemisinin is obviously a, a, an important thing to have, but there are many other things you need in order to block all the different resistance pathways. CoQ10 is actually something that's going to stop ferroptosis. So actually statins are really critical because they help to lower that antioxidant so you can create the ferroptosis much easier. Incredible. So you think that's the future? I think that will work alongside immunotherapy. And I think actually getting immunotherapies to work better is the, currently the future. Everybody's gone from 
looking at chemotherapy, then they went into angiogenesis inhibitors, and then they've now gone immunotherapies. But certainly immunotherapies can be very helpful, but they need to be made more effective. And actually ferroptosis will work alongside immunotherapies as well. I've actually had sometimes it's helping the immune system really hugely beneficial. And I think this is the way we're going is trying to get the immune system to switch back on and actually beat the cancer. But you've got to block some of the reasons why the immunotherapies don't work is because of the metabolic problems going on in the cell. So if you block those first, the immunotherapies are going to work much better. So it's always a synergy of different things. It's getting people to understand that You've got to stop things like the glucose. Well, actually, blocking glycolysis, that huge element where the cancer ferments the sugar, will help immunotherapy to work better. So it's always many factors coming into play here in order to get a better result. And that's what I want people to know. It's always combination. That's my big thing. I say it so many times. It's always a combination of things that works. Yes. Thank you, Jane, so much. You are a huge knowledge of information and learned so much today. And I know that those who are listening really appreciate your insight. And again, we will put your link to your book and to the roadmap and your resources in the show notes so that people who are interested can dig deeper and become their own Sherlock Holmes of their cancer as well. Sure. So thank you That's for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks so much, Marilise. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support our podcast, please subscribe and share it with others. Be sure to visit BelieveBig.org to access the show notes and discover our bonus content. Thanks again and keep believing big.